Welcome to Sam's Business Growth Show. I'm Sam Dunning, a digital marketing, sales, and business growth evangelist. Tune in and subscribe today as I'll be interviewing business leaders, experts, and entrepreneurs from around the globe. You'll be learning their story, how digital marketing has helped them along the way, and exclusive tips and insights to help you skyrocket your own business. Hello and welcome back to the show. I'm delighted to be joined by Mark Emond today. Mark is the founder and president at Demand Spring, a B2B marketing consultancy. Prior to founding Demand Spring back in 2012, uh, Mark was a technology and marketing exec with IBM, Cognos and Corel for around 16 years. He helps B2B marketers optimize their ability to drive pipeline and revenue. Um, they primarily work with mid-size and large-size organizations. Um, some well-known names such as Fidelity Investments, BNY Mellon, and they're headquartered in Canada um, with employees all across Canada, Boston, and North America. Mark, welcome to the show. Delighted to have you on, man. Yeah, likewise, Sam. Thanks for having me. Glad to be on today. Awesome. So there's a whole bunch of things we'd love to cover with your good self, Mark. Um, we want to know your top business growth strategies and secrets. We want to know what digital marketing techniques that you recommend to everyone tuning in. But firstly, we'd love to know your story. Um, so we'd love to know ever since leaving school, where you grew up, some of the key business events um, and places that you've worked at and lessons that you've learned up to starting your own business, Mark. So if, you could, if we could dive straight in and, and learn a bit more about yourself and how you got into the business world, that'd be great. Sure. Sounds good, Sam. So I, I am, as you mentioned, uh, I am based in Ottawa, Canada, proud Canadian, have lived and worked uh, out of Canada my entire life, um, <clears throat> but I've had, uh, I've had roles that have been very global in nature throughout my career. So I started Demand Spring in 2012, but okay. prior to that, I worked in the technology industry for uh, about 16 years, uh, organizations like Cognos in the analytics space. Cognos got bought by IBM. I was with IBM for four years in a leadership role in their analytics business um, on the marketing side, of course. <clears throat> and uh, throughout my career, I, I had the opportunity to work in roles that were very global in nature, uh, as well as uh, leading North American marketing teams. And, um, you know, I, uh, Cognos had done some amazing things, um, really were digital marketing pioneers to a large degree. We were uh, Eloqua's first million dollar account in 2005. We were Salesforce's biggest account. By 2007, we had about 1,400 inbound nurture streams out of Eloqua. We won one of nice. Series Decision's first uh, awards for return on integration, the first Eloqua Marquee Award for lead management. And that was kind of my, my inspiration for starting Demand Spring. <clears throat> we had okay. um, you know, really contributed significantly to sales pipeline and revenue from, from a marketing standpoint at Cognos. And, you know, we're, we're acquired by IBM. I was with IBM for four years, learned a lot. Um, you know, uh, obviously IBM has an amazing brand uh, and, um, you know, really worked with some great people there, worked with some great agencies as well. IBM has partnered with Ogilvy and Mather for a long time. Cognos had also worked with creative agencies. And, you know, what, what we had done at Cognos, the growth that we had helped drive from a marketing standpoint, the contributions we had in terms of demand, um, combined with an opportunity that I saw in working at both Cognos and IBM, where, you know, we worked with, with really great creative agencies um, who also tried to do demand, but struggled in that they, you know, big creative shops really make their margins on brand and have less experienced people on the demand side of the, the agency. And so I saw an opportunity to create a demand focused agency that had great experience, talented demand generation specialists. Okay. Uh, strategy from a technology, from a digital perspective, from a content perspective. And that was the vision for Demand Spring is to uh, Got it. take what we had done on the client side in, in terms of being really focused on driving demand, driving pipeline and revenue contribution for marketing with great digital practices and uh, bring that to other organizations. So with, with that, I founded Demand Spring in 2012 and that was the vision is to take that focus on demand or revenue marketing and bring it to other B2B organizations. 
Okay. Well, yeah, there's, there's some interesting discussions that we can have around demand marketing and how that is useful for businesses because that's not something we covered much yet on the show. Before we get to that, Mark, um, appreciate you with, um, as you said, you with IBM, Cognos and Corel for around 16 years. So have you always been with big IT and technology companies or was there any, ever any work that you had before them or what, you, what led you up to to actually coming into those type of organizations? Yeah, yeah, it's a good, good question. So I went to school, I went to university and um, uh, got my degree in business administration with a focus in sports administration. I'm a big sports, sports fan. Um, awesome man, same here. Good, good. Basketball coach, uh, hockey cool. goalie, golfer, you name it, soccer player. Um, awesome. Married a, married a soccer player. Um, oh, really? Okay. When I graduated, there weren't a lot of sport sport roles um, that that I found anyway. So my first first job was in the technology industry, and I, you know, fortunately, had that business administration background that helped me launch my career in marketing in the tech industry, and really just kind of stayed in the tech industry until founding DemandSpring. And one of the things that I really love about DemandSpring is we work with a lot of tech clients, but we work with a lot of clients across different industries, financial services. We've developed a real specialty in. We work with some sports organizations. We work with um, the B two B side of retailers, manufacturing right. companies, healthcare, education. So, you know, I'm kind of getting to explore different industries that I didn't have the opportunity to as much when I was in the technology industry through the work sure. we've done with various clients here. Awesome, man. No, that that sounds good. And um, as before, before we get to as we say, um, you starting up demand string. Are there any lessons that you could share with us that you learned in terms of business, in terms of sales, or in terms of marketing before you took the leap to start your own company? Because I appreciate you with those companies for some years. So, is there any anything or any golden nuggets you could share with us that you took away um, during your time there? Yeah, I mean, I think the biggest thing that you know I, I touched on was um, you know really. Uh, the intersection of strategy, content, and great technology in driving okay. engagement and relevance yep. and personalization and digital engagement. Uh, you know, like like we did at Cognos. You know, we we strive to bring that type of hyper relevance delivered through technology with great strategy and content to our clients. And you know, I I believe today the most important word in marketing is relevance, right? We are all inundated with so much noise in our inboxes, our social media channels, on the web that sure. we go to, when you're driving down the highway, billboards. Um, you know, how do you break through? It's with relevance, right? And that you know that comes from hyper personalized strategies combined with technology that's able to deliver relevance at scale. And that's probably one of the biggest takeaways that, that you know, I learned throughout my client side career and continue to learn every day with, with our clients is how do you get more and more targeted and focused and deliver that at scale across as many channels as possible to really yep. break through and engage with somebody on both a rational level as well as an emotional level in B2B to capture their, their head, their heart, and their mind. Excellent. Okay. Well, relevance is something I'd love to talk about, Mark. So it's as you say there's a heck of a lot of noise and mm. especially as, as we're around the pandemic at the time of recording this um mm. whilst it's let's say a little bit easier to reach decision makers because everyone's at home so if you pick up the phone and you've got someone's cell number or someone's mobile phone number the chances are they're probably going to pick it up because they're not in a busy office yeah. they're at home but yeah. in at the same time there's a heck of a lot of noise going out everyone's smashing social everyone's smashing linkedin everyone's smashing email marketing almost every channel is getting hammered because people have got more time on their hands to do so and sales reps marketing reps want to be hitting their quota so how do people stay or how can businesses stay relevant more so now mark is there any any tips you could share with us on how to remain relevant well i think the most important thing at this time during during this pandemic is to you know have a focus on how do you serve your ecosystem rather than selling into your ecosystem right i think okay. you know um what we're finding is there are not a lot of budget dollars flowing right now, you know, and that's, right. that's, that's fine. Um, you know, I, I think the businesses who are going to come out of this and continue to not only survive, but thrive are the ones who have a focus right now on serving people, right. Providing them okay. with information that's useful, that's relevant, that's helpful in both a professional sense and a personal sense serving in different ways you know one one example we are one small uh, example that you know in a way that we're trying to serve 
our ecosystem is we have a couple of um, certified yoga instructors on our team. So we do, all right, okay. we've always done virtual yoga over Zoom cameras across yeah. our distributed um, uh, employee base within Demand Spring. And now we're offering that out to our clients, our, our partners, um, family members, our, our board of advisors. And, um, you know, just trying to find ways like that, you know, beyond, beyond business uh, means to help people in any way we can at this point. I think, you know, you build affinity, you build loyalty if you're trying to serve at this point rather than um, trying to hard sell people. Got it. Okay. So making it a bit more personable and yeah. perhaps like you say, offering unique, unique experiences to your customers, to your clients, it sounds like, as well yeah. as your own team and your own employees. I kind of liken it to, you know, B2C is great for lifestyle marketing, right? They really try and connect and build affinity based on, um, you know, illustrating that they understand you, that they understand your lifestyle, your, your um, behaviors, your psychographics and your attitudes. And I think, you know, we can learn a lot from that in B2B, especially at this time. If we, you know, think beyond a focus on our products and think about the lifestyle of the people we engage with and the lifestyle today and try and serve them in a more holistic sense. Um, I, you know, I think that will go a long way to building the type of affinity that, um, you know, powers you through times like this. Awesome. Some, some really great advice there, Mark. Okay. So moving forward, let's talk about um, how you set up Demand Spring and mm-hmm. how that came about. What, what was the light bulb moment and how did you go about setting up? Was it just yourself, Mark, or did you have a team? Let's learn a bit more. Yeah, I mean, I think the light bulb moment, I, I don't know that there was one light bulb moment as much as just a, you know, a realization that I wanted to, I wanted to start something. I wanted to um, help people, both, uh, you know, people that worked with me and then, you know, a client base. It, together with the realization that, you know, I thought that there was um, a, a focus on great demand creation, demand management practices, revenue marketing practices that was being underserved. So, you know, I had a, a fortunate, uh, you know, situation where um, I had a support, very supportive spouse who, uh, you know, supported me going from a regular paycheck at IBM to the uncertainty of uh, starting my own business. Yeah, always helps. Um, absolutely, absolutely critical to have that support network um, and started it on my own. Uh, but, okay. you know, I had a vision right from day one that um, I wanted to build something and needed to build something um, bigger than myself. You know, the, the want was uh, I, I like to celebrate with others. You know, I didn't want to create something that was, you know, even modestly successful and, you know, not, a, not have anybody to celebrate with. And the need was in, in our business, we provide a mix of strategy, content, technology, and now even talent optimization services for marketers. And, uh, you know, I, I don't have all those skills. I don't think one person can possibly have all those skills. So really needed to rely on, on others with unique skills, be it deep technical skills, um, you know, great strategy skills, content marketers, people that understand how to build organizations and optimize talent. And so sure. we started building in about year, I think it was about year two, I started switching from, you know, just working with a team of um, kind of trusted partners to starting yep. to hire employees. And we've built okay. a team for about 18 full-time individuals now spread across Canada and the U.S. And um, serving, uh, you know, serving our clients with a, um, you know, a team that uh, has continued to grow and continued to grow, I think, the footprint we're having with B2B organizations. Amazing. So before we get to your recommended strategies for other businesses, what are some of the strategies that you took, Mark? So like you say, you're working by yourself for two years or so with outsourced or strategic partners, and then you started pulling in staff, and now you've grown to a team of 18 or so in different countries, which is amazing. So what are some of the steps or some of the, some of the reasons why you've had success and why you've had such, such good growth in a reasonably short space of time, Mark? Yeah, that's a great question, Sam. Uh, I think there's, there's you know, I would point to probably three to four, maybe five key, um, you know, key areas and key advice that I would provide to others. First of all, uh, relationships and networking is everything, you know, in, in okay. this, when you're starting a business, I think the better, the stronger the network you have um, for many reasons, not only to, um, you know, look to potentially build a client base, but just advice, support, um, you know, ongoing feedback, positive and constructive is absolutely essential. 
Uh, you know, I remember in the first year that, or actually probably the second year after starting Demand Spring, where we started experiencing a little bit of success. And, uh, you know, we were doing an annual review with our accounting firm. The partner um, at our accounting firm said to me, you know, you, people don't realize the um, value that they have in their network when they work for a company like you did. Um, it's when you get out on your own and you start something that you really unlock the value of your network when you see how that can translate into business for you. So that first and foremost, networking and results are uh, networking okay. and relationships are absolutely everything. And just before we move on, when you say networking, what are we talking, Mark? Are we talking face-to-face -face network? Are we networking? Sorry, are we talking platforms like LinkedIn? Are we talking online or email or what? What's what's well, I I would say the the um, first of all, there's the practice of networking, right? It's it's going back to people you know, people you work have worked with, people you work with now, and strengthening those relationships and and okay. identifying how they can support you. And then yeah, yep. it's using it's using you know tools and platforms like LinkedIn. So one of the things I in the last year that I was with IBM, I knew that I wanted to to move out, and I was prepping for that move to start Demand Spring. So I really went back in. I strengthened all my connections in LinkedIn. I went back and I, I expanded my, my um, first level connections. And I reached out to key people in my network to run the Demand Spring business plan by. And it was a combination of getting honest, earnest feedback and advice from people, as well as for certain people, you know, after getting advice, asking them, is this something, you know, knowing that some of them were in a position where they could potentially be a client? Would you, you know, would you be interested in considering or having a discussion about whether or not we can we can support you? Um, and some people were really honest and say, you know, I don't think it's the right time for us for whatever reason. Other people were like, yeah, absolutely, we'd love to. You know, you you offer a service that we could use. You know, I know your background. I think I'd love to have a conversation with you. So that was that was super helpful. Great so stuff. A couple, okay. couple of examples of how that you know your network is so critical. I'd say culture is also so critical we we have taken great pains to try and develop the type of culture that inspires people to come to work every day one of our philosophies is um, work from not not just work from home but work from anywhere so we have had people who have I like that. Um, yeah who have you know we've had Canadians who have moved to London and Lyon, France for six months up to two years, and we've enabled that. It's worked. They've been productive. Um, uh, and and were there any guidelines that you set, Mark? Because I know every company is different, and I know some people have, a, have an issue with letting their staff work remotely, and some bosses or owners of businesses can be concerned as well as managers. Yeah. So is there any guidelines that you could say, look, I'd recommend putting this in place or yeah. I recommend giving them full flexibility. Have you, have you got anything you can share with us on that side of things? Well, I'm a big advocate of, of work from anywhere, quite honestly. Now, we, we do have certain limits. Um, you know, we had one person who, um, you know, was looking to make a move to Asia Pacific, and it just didn't work in terms of the time zones with our clients. But beyond that, sure. if we can make it work in terms of doing the work and serving our clients, then we are absolutely for it. We believe, you know, we, we had a woman who lived in Boston and moved to North Carolina to live in a tiny house. We had another woman who, um, who uh, lived in Ottawa and was a big skier. So she moved yep. out to Western Canada to Whistler, just south of Whistler, which is one of the top ski resorts in North America. And enabling people to do this inspires them. It brings out the best in them. They're able to live the life they want and they come to work super inspired. So we have a small office in Ottawa. We have an office in Boston, but we really enable people to work from home in either of those locations. And likewise, we enable them to work and we hire anywhere else so that we get the best people the tools today are so easy. We use Zoom, we use Slack, we use yeah, you know cloud-based tools, Salesforce, Marketo, sure. Link to manage everything. And we feel like we've developed a great culture um, in spite of the fact that we're all distributed, that we're mostly virtual, um, that most of the time when we see each other, we're on a Zoom uh, call like this one. And we bring people together every six months in normal times when we're not socially distancing um, to foster those face-to-face -face connections. But we think it's worked beautifully for us. It's enabled us to hire great talent, put them in great, great places that they are inspired to work from, and we get the most out of them. Our employee promoter score, which we measure religiously, is consistently in and around um, 90 over 100. Um, and, um, you know, as a result, our client SAT scores are also above 90 over 100 consistently. So 
um, you know, that's enabled us to, to find great people and keep them inspired. So culture, networking, deep focus on clients that investing in technology that scales. One of my beliefs right from day one was to invest in technology that maybe we weren't quite big enough for yet, but that I envisioned we would grow into. So, you know, we use Salesforce CRM from day one. We've used Marketo for marketing automation. We use Drift. Um, you know, we use a number of other cloud-based and like tools. And like you say, Mark, those are big, Salesforce is a big tool for a business that's relatively small, isn't it? Um, so like, like you said, that's, is there a reason you did that? Because you just wanted to get, get to grips with a big piece of software so you could move into it? There are two reasons for Salesforce in particular. One is most of our clients working within large size organizations, most of our clients use uh, it. That makes sense. We do a lot of integration work between um, Salesforce and a lot of MarTech tools. So okay. that was one reason. And then just a general belief too that I didn't want to be in a position where we buy a technology that we don't grow in a year and then we'd have to migrate and then do the same and do the same and do the same, right? I've seen that sure. on the client side and that can be really disruptive. And Makes so sense. and I'd rather pay a little bit more to start and maybe be a little bit, um, have our pants be just a little bit too big for us, but then grow <laughs> into them and not have the, the pain in migrating consistently. Yeah, of course. Okay. And were there any other points or have we, we covered all the... Yeah, I think those are the major ones. You know, the, the, the one other one as well that's, you know, we've found to be really critical over the years is just being really prudent in financial management. <clears throat> we have a really good CFO and finance um, team. They're a virtual organization that does things like weekly cash flow analysis for us, um, does rigorous forecasting. We do um, really rigorous profitability analysis on each project. We really measure staff utilization closely and just really making sure that we're really prudently managing the profitability of the company. Um, you know, as, as per, uh, you know, probably a fair amount of your listeners, right? We are bootstrapped. We're not VC financing or private equity financed. So profitability yep, exactly. matters. Every, every month, every quarter. Um, so financial management and just staying on top of financial details with really good finance talent is also essential. Good stuff. All right, Mark, well, that was, that was really helpful, I'm sure, for both myself and everyone tuning in. Now, can you share with us any particular highs or lows of your business so far since you founded it in 2012? Are there any, any real lows that you've um, come across, Mark, and you guys, yeah. how, you, how you got out of those, and then we'll go to the highs after. Yeah, so we've pretty consistently grown the top line of our company, the, the revenue or the turnover. Um, our challenge about three years ago was we got a little ahead of our skis in terms of expenses. We didn't have the financial processes in place. This was prior to the, the organization that works with us now for financial management and governance. And so we grew our expenses a little too fast. You know, it's, it's really tough, as, as you know, I'm sure, Sam, to balance growth and profitability. It's a hard dance to get um, sure. when, you're, you know, when you're not um, VC or PE financed. And uh, you know, we, we struggled with the growth. Growth became a problem for us because we, we grew our expenses, we grew our headcount a little too fast, and we didn't measure and monitor our utilization as much as we needed to. So um, had some pain, had to make some cuts in the business. Um, but that also, you know, I, um, uh, yeah, as, as I mentioned, I'm a, a big sports fan, basketball coach. I was listening to another basketball coach, actually an NBA coach recently on a podcast talking about, you know, he doesn't believe that, um, you know, he doesn't really believe in losses. He believes in, in winning and learning, essentially. Yeah, yeah I know that one. Learned, okay, cool. What, what we learned from that was that, you know, uh, we, we learned how to manage our growth better. We learned how to manage our finances better. And that's enabled us now for the past three years to, to go on a run where we've really um, built the strongest balance sheet, the strongest, strongest cash position we've ever had, which we're so thankful for right now in this pandemic. You know, you see other organizations sure. who almost right away had to cut headcount, had to cut staff, layoffs, significant budget cuts, you know, cash flow crunch. And we haven't had any of that. We've, we've had no layoffs, no cuts. And, um, you know, we believe that our, our good balance sheet will put us in a really good position coming out of this where some other competitors are retrenching, maybe, you know, are threatened for survival, um, that we'll be, we'll be just fine. Got it. Okay. So, um, yeah, by the sounds of it, Mark, keeping a tight grip and understanding of what's going on in your business in terms of cash flow, in terms of finances, yeah. and um, not trying to grow too quickly by the sounds of it, which we've all done. It's easily yeah. done and yeah. you can't always foresee everything that's going to happen. That's for sure. 
Yeah. So, uh, what basketball team do you support? Have interest? Uh, so, being a Canadian, the Toronto Raptors, uh, the World Got Champions it. from last year, was a great <laughs> run. Uh, loved so uh, loved watching them, and you know, you get to watch them again and again every night now. Given <laughs> that uh, that's all the sports we can watch. That's least. it. <laughs> cool man okay so that was that was the um lows any any other highs that you'd like to share with us any particular big yeah points? there's you know there's been a number of highs it's been so rewarding to grow a company to hire people i think one of the things that i i enjoyed the most was when we put a benefits plan in place in probably about year three of the company knowing okay. that i was not only helping take care of employees but also their families and putting health care benefits in place for them was huge. Similar, we put in place a 401k retirement plan for our employees in the U.S. and and that was you know a great feeling. Um, so just those things to know that you know not only are we helping you know our employees but their families. Of course, you celebrate great wins, big clients, um, you know growth milestones, and I think just the individual successes of hiring really good people, seeing them grow and develop and um just seeing you know their skills uh, flourish and blossom you know super rewarding for me to see the growth in in our team and individuals and and likewise client success you know we love helping to transform clients marketing practices and um, help marketers become more strategic and um you know see seeing our clients who have made that transformation and knowing we've played a role in it um has been awesome Fantastic stuff. And um, yeah, love loved the fact that quite early on that you were looking after your own employees and helping them out of various benefits. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, I think that goes a long way. And that's obviously going to help with retain, uh, retaining your staff and making sure they're happy in what they yeah. do. Cool. So we'd love to know some of your recommended digital marketing strategies, Mark, as a fellow marketer. Um, it'd be awesome to learn what marketing you've used to personally grow your business and also what everyone what you recommend for everyone tuning in um and also a bit more about demand generation because it's not something we've really covered on the show sure yeah you know i think the foundation for us growing our business you know has been twofold one is our our relationships and our network and then secondly it's been content right so we've used digital okay. to to drive engagement but you know the the, the lifeblood of digital engagement, I think are twofold. One is data, having you know the right, the right data and the right set of people that you're talking to. And then secondly is saying the right things to them with content. So we put a real focus in our organization on being original, um, having you know, really good IP and yep. content thought leadership that we share on a regular basis. You know, I think we punch above our weight in terms of our size for the amount of content we create. The amount of thinking that we do that we share in various forms from you know our own podcast to LinkedIn videos to lots of blogging and and various um, other types of content video content audio content written content so that's always been right from you know almost day one I found a correlation between even when it was just me and I blog on a certain topic and then I post it through LinkedIn and on our on our website and through other social channels that I would have people that either I knew or maybe even knew people that I didn't know who would, you know, kind of crawl out of the woodwork, recognize the topic that we were talking about and see an opportunity to discuss it with us. You know, it served as okay. for the people that were in my network, it served to them, especially in the early days as a reminder that, oh yeah, Mark is out on his own now. He's doing, he's doing that. And I wasn't, I actually didn't know he was doing that specific thing that he was talking about in this blog, that's actually a need and a gap that we have in our organization. And that would spawn a lot of conversations that led to a lot of, a lot of um, opportunities for us in, in business. Um, so content remains critical. Beyond that, you know, as I mentioned, we, you know, we have a, a deep belief in relevance. We try and get really targeted. We've identified our, we've done a lot of persona analysis to understand our key marketing personas that we market into from CMOs to uh, VPs or directors of demand generation, digital marketing, content marketing, marketing operations. So we've built a really deep understanding of what they think, feel, and do in their buyer journey, the content and the channels that they interact with. And we try and serve it up to them, you know, based on our insights and our knowledge. We use Marketo for marketing automation to deliver really targeted um, communication to them. We continue to get better and better at that. We, we prescribe super targeted nurture um, strategies aligned to the top, middle and bottom of the funnel for our clients. And we're starting to put that in practice for ourselves more and more. Um, okay. 
uh, you know, right. those are some of the key things that we've, we've done. Got it. So it sounds like you're using, um, in terms of, um, for any business tuning in, Mark, um, I assume that most businesses should know who they're marketing to. So like you said, you're, you're targeting marketing directors, CMOs, mm-hmm. he- probably head of marketing and, and so on and so forth. If you're, um, you mentioned you, you kind of know under their skin, so you know what they're thinking and you know the kind of content that they like to consume. Mm-hmm. and these kind of points but how did you get that knowledge and how could someone that's perhaps not a specialist marketer get to know these kind of insights so then they can put out content that's relevant to their ideal customer yeah you know so one of the foundational things that uh we we recommend to clients is to do buyer persona research or buyer journey research right if you don't have a real fundamental understanding of what your buyers are thinking, feeling, and doing in each stage of the buyer journey so that you can translate that into a messaging strategy, a content strategy, and a marketing channel strategy, then yep. you're spending money on execution without having you know, a great knowledge of you know, where and how and, and what you should say to people. And I think you can, you can waste some dollars. So we always believe that a good investment upfront in buyer persona, buyer journey research will save you money and create a return on investment in the long run. So that, that would be where I would start is, you know, and we, we do this for a lot of our clients where we'll go in and we'll do primary research in the form of telephone interviews, face-to-face interviews in times of non-pandemic um, and uh, quantitative surveys and help them get the insights that can then help them build a stronger marketing plan, a stronger engagement plan. Um, you know, and there's also beyond that, there's a lot of tertiary research out there as well that organizations can tap into. As you know, there's no lack of content being created on any topic, targeting any any type of persona these days. So leveraging a combination of primary research, like I just recommended, and oh. uh, secondary tertiary research is what we recommend. And on that subject, Mark, is there any way, um, I know we talk about personalization and things like that, but is there any tips that you can share with us on standing out in terms of your content? Um, is there any way to stand out, especially in a flooded market? So if something mm-hmm. what you do, uh, what we do, of course, digital marketing is there's so many competitors. So is there any, any ways that businesses can stand out from the crowd and the content they put out? You know, I think it's just really understanding your buyers and speaking to them with a high degree, again, that word relevance, right? And, and when I say relevance, sure. I'm not just talking about, you know, on the B2B side of things, rational points, right? That may, um, you know, tap into their minds and resonate with them rationally, but also emotionally, right? We all yep. know that when... A lot of studies that have reinforced that um, B2B buyers are humans as well. They have emotions. And the more you can tap into those emotions in a B2B buying process, the better the influence in conversion it has. So really understanding what are their fears? What are their motivators? Um, what are their aspirations? And how can you tap into that in your, in your messaging, in your content? Um, you know, the more you do that, the more effective you're going to be at driving conversion. Yeah, good stuff. There's a lot of stats out there and data that say people buy emotionally and then rationalize it um, intellectually. So that, that makes perfect sense, man. Okay. And if you had to pick one particular channel of marketing Mark, that's had specific or the best results rather for your company, is there one? So was it blogs? Was it white papers? Was it email? Was it LinkedIn? Was it SEO? Was it something else? Yeah, I would say, you know, first of all, we're big believers in multi-channel marketing that you really want to surround your 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 target your ideal client profile and your target personas with a multi-channel approach. Um, you know that you know includes email, includes social for sure, includes uh, you know optimizing your website. Uh, you know, recently we've we've created a partnership with Drift, and we're doing conversational marketing for our clients. Um, okay. I think that that has um, there's a lot of really neat personalization aspects there. But you know, overall, I would say the one thing that has helped our business more than anything else has been um, creating great content and then using social channels. You know, especially because we are, you know, in starting a business and growing a business, our database is relatively small, right? So we love email marketing. But, you know, for us, there's a much bigger community out there on third party sites and on social channels like LinkedIn than than we own in our own database, right? And our database has grown and our email is increasingly really effective, especially as it gets more relevant, targeted, and we we drive more nurture communication than broadcast. But I would say to date that social channels, LinkedIn especially, has been a great channel for us, you know, and even just organic, not even paid LinkedIn for us, Um, you know, posting. Uh, articles, doing posts, amplifying those, 
and um, you know, just uh, being out there, especially at a time like this. One of the things that I'm challenging our team, our leadership team to do is be visible, communicate um, in a time like this. The more that we can serve our audiences and be visible and communicate um, through the challenges people are having, and LinkedIn is a great channel to do that. Um, the more that um, you know, it'll benefit our clients, we'll serve people and we'll serve our own business. Terrific, couldn't agree more. Okay, um, for anyone listening that's just started up their business, Mark, or anyone that's thinking of starting up a business, are there any pieces of advice that you could give that may help them? Well, I'd say, uh, you know, get, get advice from trusted individuals around you. Um, and, you know, it's always scary to start a new business. You're always, you know, you feel like you're stepping off a ledge. That said, most of the people that I know who have done it have been really successful. Um, their, you know, their worry has been, I won't have enough business. The converse has actually happened where they found after a little while that I've got too much business, that I'm too busy, right? Um, so, you know, it's always gonna be scary. You've gotta have a great support network around you. Like I said, you know, your family. Um, Agreed. Uh, you know, leverage the network that you have to get good advice and to really test your ideas and your thoughts. Um, but at some point, it's still going to be, you're still going to be stepping off that ledge and you just have to realize that it's going to be scary. Um, but that if you have a good enough idea, you've got good support around you and you've tested your idea and thoughts um, and you believe in yourself, that chances are you will be successful. And, uh, you know, once you start, it comes down to a lot of grit, right? There's going to be good days. There's going to be bad days. And you just got to keep going back, iterating, improving, growing, being ready to be agile in your offering, in your thoughts, right? Test, test what you're doing. And you may find that, you know, the idea you started with on day one looks much different on day 365 uh, in year two, in year three, in year four, right? You want to market test, iterate continue to optimize and uh, not be beholden to a set solid plan on your offering on day one that you don't change in the face of, um, you know, getting feedback that it might not be exactly what the market needs. Excellent stuff, Mark. And on that note, have you got any habits that you follow each day or any habits you recommend people should follow in order to be successful? Uh, you know, I just try and uh, for me, um, trying to, Exercise is huge. Um, you know, I think Definitely it's, uh, you know, as you know, Sam, when you're running a business, right, you can, it can be pretty all consuming. Um, so trying to make sure that you, you build enough balance into your day, that you're exercising, that you're spending enough time with family and friends and that you've got other hobbies. Uh, you know, for me, coaching, coaching basketball, for example, forces me at the end of the day to get out of the yep. house, to go to a gym and coach uh, my daughter and, and, you know, other 12 and 13 year old girls um, and gives me the balance that I need. So, you know, just figure out a way where um, in my experience where your work doesn't consume you. Good stuff. Yeah. I'd say even more so important during this pandemic is going on right now because like many, I'm working from home and it's, it's kind of difficult, isn't it, Mark, to separate, I found anyway, to separate the work times from kind of personal time and making sure you've got time to exercise. And like you say, it's just getting the balance right and not yeah. burning out. Yeah, I, you know, I'm, as I mentioned before, I'm a big believer in work from anywhere and work from home. I, I believe that you can be so productive working from home, but the downside, like you just said, is uh, work is much harder to shut off when it's that that accessible, right? When you have your 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 laptop in your home office that you walk by on the way to the kitchen or somewhere else in your house, right? It becomes really tempting to just go in, check email, then you start working on a project, and the next thing you know, you're spending two hours, you know, in time where you wanted to be spending it with your family or just doing things to satisfy other parts of of your being. So that is the challenge. Too true, too true. Awesome. Right, Mark, it's been an absolute pleasure. Everyone, you've been tuning into Sam's Business Growth Show, where we sit down with business leaders, experts, and entrepreneurs from around the globe. We find out their story, how digital marketing has helped them along the way, and their exclusive tips and insights to help you skyrocket your business. Mark, I'd like to ask everyone um, if you could thank just one person, either dead or alive, for having a positive influence on your life and your career, who would that be and why? 
Oh, that is such a great question. It's hard, you know, it's really hard for me to identify just one per. you know, the one person would definitely be my wife, um, who's just been so supportive and just, um, you know, every, you know, every single day um, throughout this, this journey, which is now eight years of owning DemandSpring, um, has been uh, just a rock in terms of support for me in doing this and never kind of second guessing or doubting that this was the right thing for me to do. She realized that I needed to do this for my, my soul. Beyond that, we've had such great support. We have a board of advisors at DemandSpring that's comprised of CMOs and people with different backgrounds that has been absolutely essential to our growth and success. Uh, you know, them combined with um, our leadership team and indeed all the people I work with at DemandSpring who just make me excited to go to work every day. It's a great group of people that creates a great culture that I just love working with. So, you know, the one person would be my wife, but, um, you know, the broader support network that we have from our board to our leadership team to all of our employees would be people that make this journey so um, rewarding for me. Excellent. I love that last sentence you said, being excited to go to work every day. Um, which, which I believe is so important. If, if you're going to, you've got to be passionate about what you do and to get the yeah. real results. I have a saying that your, your work should enrich your life, not diminish it. Right. So if you're in a, if you're in a job, you're in a role where you don't feel like your work's enriching your life. And, you know, for me anyways, it's time to rethink, am I, am I in the right role or do I need to find something that, that enriches my life? Excellent. Okay, Mark, well, let us know the best way that people can get in touch with your good self, how people can connect with you. Tell us a quick snapshot of your company and the best way people can get in touch. Yeah, I mean, you can, uh, you can go to check out more about DemandSpring at demandspring.com. And uh, we're, on, we're on LinkedIn, Facebook, and Twitter as well at DemandSpring. And uh, if you wanted to get in touch with me directly, just email me, Mark, M-A-R-K, at demandspring.com. Awesome stuff. The show is sponsored by webchoiceuk.com, helping businesses skyrocket their leads, sales, and brand positioning with SEO, results-driven digital marketing, conversion-focused websites, and custom web and mobile applications. That's webchoiceuk.com. Thank you very much, Mark. Thanks, Sam. Take care. Cheers. Have a great day. Subscribe today for more digital marketing, sales, and business growth tips from the experts.